بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته as is well known uh, the topic of tonight's lecture and the theme in the series is regarding the prophets and the messengers and their lives and what do we as muslims daily muslims 9 to 5 muslims and muslims who have knowledge muslims who are scholars students of knowledge imams fathers mothers sons husbands wives children etc what do we benefit from these stories and how do we learn from these stories and how do these stories have an effect upon what we believe in our aqida our iman our tawhid and our actions our prayer our fasting and our zakah how do these stories have an effect upon our behavior our character how we deal with one another how do these stories help us and how do they shed light upon the current state of affairs of the world today the world in which we live in today in which there's muslim and non-muslim there's majority there is minority we have problems we have challenges and we have many many issues how do we relate to these stories and what do we get from these stories are they relevant are they outdated are they abrogated are they old and ancient fables and stories of folklore and legend And what do we do and how do we behave with those who don't accept these stories and don't believe in these stories? And or how are these stories to be used with regards to calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making da'wah, inviting non-Muslims to Al-Islam, and inviting Muslims who have strayed from the correct path to the correct path, and inviting Muslims who have strayed from the correct path back to the correct path. because living in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, in the United States, Canada, Australia, South Africa, uh France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, any country which is kiss considered to be western, let alone eastern or middle eastern or north african or central africa, but we're dealing with western countries, we have a cocktail of people. And we have a mixture of people and there's never ever one audience. There are those who are non-muslims. And obviously they have a variety those who are Christians and different types of Christians those who are Jewish different types of Jews those who are Hindus those who are Buddhists etc and then we have Muslims Muslims who are ignorant and need to be taught Muslims who are knowledgeable but they're sinful and they need to be reminded Muslims who are busy and preoccupied and they need to be brought back to the dhikr Muslims that have never ever been taught the correct way this is what they think Islam is Muslims who have migrated from far eastern or middle eastern or north african etc any country of muslims and then they live in the uk and they never knew that there was something called sunna or hadith they never knew what was aqida they were taught that there was a madrasa or madrasa and you sit around and there's a, a teacher with a slab with a scroll with some ink and a stick and he hits the children recite this surah make this prayer respect your teacher and that's it Then they come and they drive cabs or they own stores or they own malls or markets and then you come and you walk past them and say why do you have such a big beard why are your pants so short why does your wife cover up like that what color is your wife i can't see anything on her all i see is black everything is covered this is extreme this is too much etc so what do you do now how do you deal with these people how do you deal with yourself first and foremost your children your own family your step children etc so there lies no doubt the answer to all of these questions and the solution to each and every one of these principles is not only mentioned in the Quran specifically or generally directly or indirectly but oftentimes if not each and every single time it is going to be mentioned in the sira of the prophets and the messengers the sira of the anbiya and the rusul the prophets and the messengers and specifically and especially the seerah of our prophet and our messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam so that's point number 1 point number 2 is not only are these problems and their answers these questions and their answers these issues and their solutions mentioned in the Quran and in the stories of the prophets and the messengers but in most cases they're going to be mentioned in the style of a story 
بصيغة قصة A story Allah Azza wa Jal Often times He doesn't just tell us This is haram and this is halal This is obligatory And this is recommended And this is disliked When it comes to the prophets and the messengers But nine out of ten times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He gives us a story Of the prophets and of the messengers And of course there are different times And there are different styles in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about prophets and messengers. And it isn't necessarily in the style of a story. It isn't necessarily in the style of a story. Such as when Allah Azza says, Ya ayyuhal nabi, ittaqillah. Fear Allah. Ida talaqatum un nisa. When you divorce, etc. That's a direct command to the Prophet. And it's not necessarily Allah telling us a story. But the previous prophets and messengers, nine out of ten times, if not ten out of ten, ten times, is going to be in a style of a story. And why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us a story? And what is the power of the story on the mind and on the heart? Why is one of the most important ways of tarbiyah, child education, nurturing your children is to tell them a story? Your mother may have told you a hundred things, a thousand things. You may have been given so many different lessons and stories and commandments and prohibitions. But the things that you remember to this day is what? Are the stories that she told you? Are the stories that your mother or your father read to you before you went to sleep? Why is there a specific genre of books called bedtime stories? Because everyone likes a story. If I was given a technical lesson and explaining something and going over this point and this principle, a few people would listen. A few people would understand, a few people would pay attention, but if I mention a personal story, a real life story, or a made up story, how many people would lend their ears attentively? How many people would lend their ears attentively? How much, how much money is spent every year on books and on novels that are beneficial or aren't beneficial, that are truthful and factual or total and utter lies? Because the nature of the human being is to be delighted in hearing a story. And that's why Allah Azza wa has mentioned an abundance of stories in the Qur'an al-Kareem. However, these stories aren't just stories. They're not just to tickle our imaginations and to romanticize and to sensualize or sensationalize. Rather, they're meant to teach. They're meant to enlighten. They're meant to purify. They're meant to heal and to make remedy. Uh, all of the prophets and all of the messengers. Uh, and it's a very interesting fact that uh, with regards to Su, uh, Hud alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, one of the most comprehensive verses about this entire concept, the concept of stories and the prophets and the messengers and teaching and reminding, etc., is mentioned in the surah that's called Hud alayhi salatu wasalam, which is the 11th chapter of the Quran al kareem Naam, surah Hud, tayyib, khayrin inshallah. Now, before we move forward, uh, we have to understand something. And that is, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the end of this surah, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ Allah says, and we give you, and we explained this last night, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ O Muhammad, Allah is telling and speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu and if He's telling the Prophet to do something, and of course He's also telling us to do that thing. And we need that thing even more, even more. So Allah he says, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ Each and every story, of each and every prophet, each and every messenger, we give you information. We give you a qissa, a story. مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُعَادَكَ Which we use to strengthen your heart. And if the prophet's heart had to be strengthened, then what about our hearts? If the prophet needed to be reminded, then what about us and our forgetfulness and our heedlessness and our disobedience and our stubbornness and our mutiny? against ourselves and against Allah and against those who have rights and responsibilities over us. So Allah, he says, Man bihi That we use these stories, O Muhammad, to strengthen your heart and to solidify your heart. فِي هَذَا He says, and in this story, in this qissa, that the truth has come to you. الْحَقُّ وَمَوْعِذَةٌ Allah says, and in a reminder, Huh? And remembrance and an admonition for the mu'mineen, for those who believe. So Surah Hud in general, or specifically, Hud alayhi salam generally and specifically, the entire Quran, the prophets and the messengers generally and specifically, they give us these three things. Number one, the truth. What do we believe about the prophets and the messengers? Number two is mu'idah. 
and an admonition is a means of cleansing and washing away and softening hearts that have become hard, that have become blackened, that have become rusted, and also dhikra. Just a, a sheer simple reminder that doesn't necessarily need to penetrate your heart. There's a difference between the two. There's a difference between the two. Anyone and everyone needs to be reminded. And there's certain people who their hearts need to be penetrated. Are we understanding the difference? And oftentimes, someone who's smart and intelligent, the only thing that he needs is a quick, simple pointer. And that's it. That's enough. And someone who doesn't have that type of intelligence, he needs a lecture. He needs you to be over him, telling him, instructing him specifically what to do. So there's a difference between a reminder and between sometimes a mo'idha, something that's heart softening or heart penetrating, etc. So this is, these are general principles with regards to Hud, alayhi salam, and the entire Qur'an, all of the prophets, and all of the messengers. So with that being said, uh, in the limited amount of time that we have here, uh, know for sure that speaking about the prophets and the messengers and their stories and what we benefit from them is going to be a branch of another science and another field. And that is the, the field of a tafsir explaining the Qur'an. And that is because these prophets and messengers in uh, most of the cases or most times they're mentioned in the Qur'an. However, the previous prophets and messengers before the Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, oftentimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us pieces of their story. And oftentimes the story isn't necessarily mentioned in chronological order. Allah, he talks about Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and Fir'aun. And Musa and Fir'aun is not in the beginning of the life of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Naam. Sometimes there's certain prophets and messengers, the only thing that Allah tells us about them is how his people were destroyed. That's it. Or in one surah, he speaks about the discussion in this city or this town. And in another surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla, he speaks about the discussion in another place in another town. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a chronological order. Now, there are some people who are non-Muslim. They study the Qur'an and they were fascinated with the Qur'an. It's an amazing and fantastic book. There's no doubt about that. Even though we don't believe in it. And it's so amazing and so fantastic that if we allow the Muslims or the Mohammedans to realize how fantastic it is and to study it and to benefit from it and to uh, truly understand it and practice it, we're going to have a major problem. A major problem. So therefore, it is our absolute duty to get the Muslims not to read the Qur'an and not to understand the Qur'an and not to realize how awesome and how fantastic the Qur'an is. And if they do read the Qur'an at best, then we can cause doubt. And we can cast doubt. And we can cause confusion about the Qur'an. And that is exactly what they have done. And from the things that they mentioned to prove that the Qur'an isn't true. And it's made up. And it's conjure. And the Prophet or Muhammad, he just put it together. Things that he stole from the Jews of Medina. Things that he got from the Christian caravans going to Syria. Things that he got from the soothsayers. Things that he came up with, etc. Is that the stories of the prophets and the messengers are not mentioned in chronological order. It's one of the proofs that they use. Is that Allah, he tells us about this prophet and he clearly became, came before that prophet. Who was the first prophet? Was it Adam? Who was the first messenger? Was it Nuh? Regardless of the first thing that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, or the first surah that's mentioned in the organized mushaf, for sure it isn't Adam and it isn't Nuh. That's a fact. It isn't Adam or Nuh. Period. Whether Adam was a, or wasn't a prophet. It's not Adam, first and foremost. The first one that's mentioned as a prophet and a messenger being sent to his people. Adam is mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. But does Allah mention that he was a prophet and he was sent to his people? Not necessarily. Nuh alayhi salatu was was supposed to be the first messenger sent to his people as a messenger, as a warner. And he wasn't necessarily mentioned as the first one sent to his people in the Quran. Are we to understand this? The story of Nuh alayhi salam himself, the story of Adam alayhi salam himself, the story of these prophets and messengers, they say they're scattered all over the place. So it proves that it's made up because they aren't mentioned in order. And it only makes sense to start off with someone from their first step. Childhood, education, upbringing, enlightenment, and them then being dispatched and sent to their people, etc. This is what they say. Everyone understand this or not? So this is one of the proofs that they use. And unfortunately, this doubt uh, has proven true against many weak-minded people. And many people who look towards the non-Muslims with a look of admiration and oftentimes hero worship. 
that everything that they say and do and come up with is superior to that of the Muslims. And we know that this is totally false. And in actuality, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. And that is because the main wisdom of the stories of the prophets and the messengers is not to learn history, nor is it to learn the chronological history of events. But the most important thing of the stories of the prophets and the messengers is to take the lesson, the benefit, and the reminder. And that is something that many Muslims have strayed away from. And they romanticize stories. And they mention this unnecessary detail. And this thing which isn't factually proven. And this thing which is weak and baseless to get the people's attention and love. And the most important thing of the story isn't the specific, the specific detail. But it is the main lesson from the life of Adam alayhi salam. Or the life of Nuh alayhi salam. Or the life of the prophet that we wish to mention tonight, which is Hud alayhi salatu salam. So with that being said, we're not necessarily going to get into the specifics of Hud, even though they have been mentioned by many of the ulama. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he mentions in Al-Bidai wa Nihaya, and many uh, scholars of Tafsir, they talk about the lineage of Hud, where he came from. Was he Arabian or Arabic or of Arabian ancestry or not non-Arab? Um, they talk about the language of Hud, alayhi salam. What language did he speak? Was he the first person to speak the Arabic language? Nam. Where did Hud alayhi salam live? Was it Yemen? Was it Oman? Was it Jordan? Hmm? And things like this. Which is nothing wrong with learning about them, studying them, coming across them. But none of these things are core issues. It matters not where Hud lived. It matters not what language he spoke. It matters not who was his father or grandfather or son. None of these things are core issues. What's important is that there was a man whose name was Hud alayhi salam. He received divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was sent to a people with a message. And they said something. They gave their response. And Allah azza wa he did something with them and to them. And how does that apply to 2018 in Birmingham? I wouldn't understand this. Someone who brings me information, someone who tells me something, do I listen or do I shut my ears? Where is this person from? You're too young or you're a woman or you're from a different country or you're from a different background. So I don't have to listen to you. Weren't you just here? Weren't you ju just doing this? Weren't you just a non-Muslim? Weren't you just misguided? Weren't you, weren't you, weren't you? So we don't have to listen to you. And when that happens to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do something to and with us. And that thing, of course, is going to be nothing more than punishment. Whether it's direct punishment or delayed punishment. Whether it's punishment on our physical bodies or punishment, which may be worse than that, that's the punishment of deafness of the ears, blindness of the eyes, and the punishment of death of one's heart. So that is the most important point of the story of Hud alayhi salatu wasalam. And all of the prophets and all of the messengers as well. You drive around in certain countries and certain lands and you find on the backseat of someone's window a sticker, Sallu ala al-Habib. It says on a sticker, Sallu ala al-Habib. Salli ala al-Habib. And they say, Sallallahu alayhi wa which is an excellent thing. And it's an act of ibadah. And it's a command from Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's something that the Prophet encouraged us to do to send prayers upon him. But how often do you pray? Have you made five prayers today? He says, no, Allah yahdi, you know, may Allah guide me. But he clearly says, Sallu ala al-Habib. And the Prophet and Muhammad, Isra wal Mi'raj, and the Mawlid, and the list and the list goes on and on and on and on. Loving the Prophet, no doubt about that. You can't be a believer unless you love Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. You can't get Allah's love unless you follow the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu There's no doubt about that. But the main message and the most important core kernel issue of Muhammad in his life was to say that you love him and to romanticize things or to do what? Follow him. And to obey him and to live in a righteous manner. Everyone understand this? And as a clarification, Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is no doubt he was loved by Allah, but the proper terminology is the Prophet is Khalilullah and not Habibullah. Khalilullah. The Prophet sallam, he says, Allah has taken me as his Khalil, just like he took Ibrahim as his Khalil. Does the, Allah love Muhammad? There's no question. But the proper status is Khalil. And if someone has a higher status or a bigger or greater title, then of course it makes no sense for you to address them with the lower and lesser title. Everyone understand this? And where does this come from? Is there an ayah or a hadith that says that Muhammad is Habibullah? Where does this come from? 
And the text clearly says that he is the Khalil. And the Khalil is the highest level of Allah's love, which is of three levels or three categories. There is Al-Mahabba, there's Al-Mawadda, and then there is Khulla. And they are not the same. The first is the basic level, basic in our understanding and terminology. Hmm? Nothing about Allah Azza wa and his actions are basic. Allah loves the believers. Those who believe and do righteous deeds, say, يَجَعَلُ لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَنُ وُدًّا Allah Rahman will make for them wood. That's not the same level as mahabba. Huh? huh? Allah will forget will, will love you. Huh? In kuntum tuhibun Allah, fatabiuni, huh? Tayyib. So we have love, which is the basic standard level. And then there is mawadda, like al wadud. Wahu al ghafur al wadud. And then the highest level of Allah's love is al khulla. For someone to be his Khalil. And that is mentioned to us, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the, ter the proper terminology is Khalilullah. Everyone understand this. Tell you, with that being said, with that being said, the most important uh, lesson from Hud alayhi salam is not or isn't these details which oftentimes aren't factual. And that's because Hud alayhi salam lived a very long time ago. And we know that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam and his ummah they were the only ones to be given the special gift of al-isnad. This ummah has been picked out and selected with three special things. And from those special things is al-isnad, the chain of narration. Ibn Hazm, rahim Allah ta'ala, he discusses this in great detail about the Jews and the Christians and how far back they can accurately trace information. And it's nothing like that of the Muslims. Even though there's usage of the Isnad. You study uh, Hinduism or Hindus, they use Isnad. Buddhist and Buddhism, there is a usage of the Isnad. But it's nothing like the Isnad in Al-Islam. So oftentimes we can't trace back these facts. But it's something which was mentioned. It's something which was said. As we mentioned last night, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, anni walaw ayah. He says, narrate from me, pass on the message, even if it's one sentence. If that's all you know, pass it on to someone else. And it's nothing, and there's no sin, there's nothing wrong with narrating from Banu Israel. As long as you don't affirm a lie, or as long as you don't reject a fact. It's nothing wrong with mentioning what the Israelites have said about the previous prophets and messengers. And we know in Al-Islam, when there were many battles, and there were Muslim traders, and there were Muslim uh, preachers called to Allah, they went to new lands. And in those new lands, they discovered people with different religious and spiritual backgrounds. In al Madina, it was pretty simple. Jewish, mushrik. In Mecca, it was relatively simple. Someone who was a mushrik, idolater, someone who may have been a Zoroastrian, rarely, Someone who may have worshipped the stars, things like this. They call the Prophet ﷺ, Ibn Abi Kepsha. They call him a Sabit. They call him a Sabit, one who worshipped the stars because he came with a new religion that wasn't that of Quraysh. But it wasn't a mixture of religions and spiritual backgrounds. But that's not the case when the Muslims went to Iraq, when the Muslims went to Persia, when the Muslims went to Egypt, when the Muslims went to North Africa, when they went to Mesopotamia, these different regions and lands, they came across people with different backgrounds. And obviously they became Muslim. And when they became Muslim, the skills and the talents that they had and the knowledge of their scriptures, it was interesting and useful to the Muslim scholars. So some of the Sahaba and some of the Tabi'un, instead of wasting and neglecting this knowledge, they sat with them and they learned from them. And a famous example of this is Ka'b al-Ahbar. You read in the name of the books of Hadith, Ka'b al-Ahbar. He was from Bani Israel before he accepted Islam and he had a wealth of knowledge. He was a scholar of the previous religions and the companions and other tabi'in, they sat with him and they studied with him. We know the different battles, some of the companions, if you conquer a land or you take over a country or city or there's a battle, then of course there are going to be spoils. There are going to be many, many spoils. And the spoils of war don't necessarily mean gold and silver or people that are taken into bondage, etc. But you're going to come across information. You're going to come across libraries. You're going to come across loads of scrolls and manuscripts. 
And some of the companions, they packed these books and these scrolls on the backs of camels and they took them with them. And they read and they studied those previous narrations. And they used them to fill in the gaps of the inexplicit details in the Quran about prophets and messengers. Like we said last night. Talking about Suleiman, alayhi salatu right? You know what I mean? Like we said last night. And the same applies to Hud, alayhi salatu wasalam. So we have history. We have tafsir. We have all of these different sciences and fields. And oftentimes the information isn't actually factual. But there's no sin in mentioning it and narrating it as long as it does not shame the prophets and the messengers. The story of Dawood alayhi salam, it was a woman that he loved and he lusted after. But the woman was married to a man. So there was a battle and he took her husband and he placed them on the front line of the battle. In other words, for him to be from the first casualties. So once he's killed and dead, he would take that man's wife. That's false. That's batil. It's totally incorrect. But it doesn't mean that there aren't other narrations about Dawood alayhi salam where he went, where he was, how many people was in the army, etc. Everyone understand this? And the same applies to Hud alayhi salatu wasalam. So we want to focus on the most important part of his story in the Quran. And the most important lesson of his story in the Quran. Everyone understand this, inshallah ta'ala? And hopefully this is a template that you can use for Ibrahim, for Nuh, you can use for Shu'aib, you can use for Ilyas, Ishaq, you can use for all of those prophets and messengers mentioned this comprehensive template there are things which are factual there are things which are clearly wrong made up we do not accept at all and then there are things which are in the middle and that is the meaning of the hadith hadithu an bani israila wala haraj there's nothing wrong with narrating from Banu Israel. Everyone understand this? It is a comprehensive template that you can use for any prophet or any messenger. Everybody clear on this or not? Our prophet Muhammad والسلام, the rules apply the same. And that's because every detail about the prophet and every battle and his companions isn't mentioned in an authentic hadith. There are many stories of the seerah that don't make the mark in the sciences of hadith. There are many famous Sira stories that aren't necessarily authentic, but they are well known. They are famous and they've been passed down by the ulama generation after generation. Everyone understand this? It's a difference now. It's a difference. Khayran, inshallah ta'ala. So with that being said, Hud alayhi salatu wasalam is generally after Nuh. It's pretty much consensus that he came after Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, as is mentioned in the Quran. He came after Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, and in general, he came before Salih. Hmm? His people came after Nuh and before Salih in general. That's point number one. Point number two is what? As Hud alayhi salatu wasalam was mentioned in the Quran approximately seven times. Seven times Allah has mentioned him in his glorious book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Hud, for example, in Surah 7, Al-A'raf. Hmm? And obviously he talks about him in Surah Hud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him in Surah Al-Mu'minun. Hmm? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him in Surah Al-Ahqaf, in Surah Fussilat. He's mentioned in the Quran in different times and in different places. And he's also mentioned in Surah number 27, Ash-Shu'ara, the, 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 the Surah of the Poets. Naam? He talks about Hud alayhi salatu wasalam. The two Surahs that have the most detail about his life, or his da'wah, and there's another place as well, with regards to his lineage, his genealogy, directly or indirectly, which is Surah Al-Fajr. Surah Al-Fajr as well. Hmm? However, the surahs that entail the most detail of Hud alayhi salatu wasalam, we know is Al-A'raf and Hud, in which Allah talks about the discussion, the debate, and the argument between him and between his people. And that is what we want to focus on tonight and how it benefits us as Muslims in 2018. How it can benefit our lives and our marriages, how it can benefit our raising of our children, and inshallah, how it can benefit our da'wah to non-Muslims or to stubborn Muslims or ignorant Muslims or Muslims who have been snatched away by the streets. Your son, your daughter that you raise, but for one reason or another, they get tattoos or they drink or they join a gang or they have illegitimate children, or they don't want to pray, or they don't want to wear hijab. They've erred from the correct path. How do we talk with these people, and how do we talk and deal with ourselves? So that's what we want to focus on tonight. Bi'idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as where we want to read from, uh, then it is a book of tafsir, that like all the books of tafsir, has a what we call a miza. 
A misa is a distinguishing or distinguished feature, a mark that sets this book aside from the other books of tafsir. So, who can name for me a book of tafsir? Off the top of your head. Tafsir ibn Kathir. What's the name of his book? That, that's not Ibn Kathir's book. What's the actual name of Ibn Kathir? Just like Sahih al-Bukhari, that's not the name of Imam Bukhari's book. He never called his book Sahih al-Bukhari. That's the colloquial term, the commoner term. Who said that, Fadl? La, not Tafsir al-Kabir. Good guess, good attempt. What's the name of Ibn Kathir's book? Who knows? Ta'i, Ahsent. Another book of Tafsir is what? Imam al-Sadi. Al what's the name of his book? Tafsiri Kalam Al Manan Al Manan. I helped him out because at least he came what? Proper when I begin. Exactly. I sent. Very good. So another book of Tafsir quickly. Adwa'ul Bayan. Tayyip, finish the title. That's not the whole title, that's only part of it. Fi Tafsir al Qurani Bil Quran. Adwa'ul Bayan fi Tafsir al Qurani Bil. Bin Quran by Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Ah, send another book of tafsir quickly. Ha Al Jalalain. Who's that by? A Suyuti and it says Al Jalalain. The two Jalals. Jalal Adin A Suyuti and Ah, send. Barakallah Fiqh. Tayyip, very good. Another book of tafsir quickly. We mentioned Asadi. A tabri what's the name of his book? You got to know. Al-La Jami'ul Bayan. Fi, there's more to it as well. Fi, complete it. Another book, one more, inshallah. Another famous one. Al-Qurtubi, what's the name of his book? It's Green Lane Mosque or what? What's the name of Qurtubi's book? Anybody? The name of Qurtubi, no one knows the name of Qurtubi's book? Raise the right hand. Al Yameen, always the Yameen, never the Shemal. Fadda. Ahsan, Barakallah fiqh al Jami' li Ahkam al Quran. So, we have these different books of Tafsir, and they have their different names. And as I said to you, most of them, and not all of them, they have their different points, their mazaya. So, briefly, what's the main feature of Ibn Kathir? What sets his book apart from the other books? Quickly. Hadith, ascent, is that it is, uh, ha, is enriched with hadith, full of hadith. Some of the ulama said as if the whole Musnad of Imam Ahmad is in Ibn Kathir's book. Tayyib, Qurtubi, the main benefit of his book is what? Al fiqh, al hakam, and also al qiraat. Tayyib, ascent. Number three, Sa'di, what's the biggest benefit of Sa'di's tafsir? It's concise. La, their book's far more concise than Sa'di, ten times more concise than Sa'di. La ascent, tarbiya, spiritual things, cultivating the soul, etc. Tayyib. Wa hakada. Wa la hada. Faqis. Everyone understand this? And the same applies to the books of hadith. They share general things, but each book has its own specific what? Virtue. What's the most well rounded book of Kutub al Sitta al Amin? Be careful of what you say. Somebody may disagree with you. They may, maybe the first time they hear this, they may not believe it. Well, Tirmidhi? <laughs> I thought it was Bukhari. Not Bukhari. Not Sahih Muslim. Why is this, Abdul Qawi? Why is the Tirmidhi's book the most well rounded of the six? Alameen, bring up the rear. Why is the Tirmidhi's book the best? Why do we say it's best pound for pound? For what reason? Such as? Huh? It doesn't have repetition. There are other books that don't have repetition in it as well. Classifies them. You can't necessarily find it in Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or Sunan Abi Dawood or Nasai, even though they do make rulings as well sometimes. What else? Brief. This is not the topic of our discussion, brothers. Yalla Alameen, you've. لا يا أخي that's not enough طيب خير إن شاء الله المهم ابن سعد رحمه الله تعالى I want to read from his tafsir tonight إن شاء الله and as we said his brother Amir has given us the benefit a tarbiyah and other brothers as well is that ابن سعد's book is concise 
And his main focus is on the main lessons from the Quran, especially how it has an effect on the soul, the tarbiyah. Have we understand this? Ibn Sidi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says here in surah number seven, surah al-A'raf. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about hud in some type of detail, in some type of detail. Allah says, after seeking his refuge, وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ عُوْضُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ قَالَ الْمَلُؤُ الَّذِينَ كَافُرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ إِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِي سَفَاهَةً وَإِنَّا لَنَظُنُّكَ مِنَ الْكَذِبِينَ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ لَيْسَ بِي سَفَاهَةً وَلَكِنِّي رَسُولٌ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قال ابن السعد رحمه الله تعالى قال رحمه الله وأرسلنا إلى عادنا لولا الذين كانوا في أرض اليمن أخاهم في النسب خودا عليه السلام يدعوهم إلى التوحيد وينهاهم عن الشرك والطغيان في الأرض فقال لهم يا قوم عبد الله ما لكم من إله غيره أفلا تتقون سخطه وعذابه إن أقمتم على ما أنتم عليه فلم يستجيبوا وننقادوا ف قال الملو الذين كفروا من قومه أرادين لدعوته قادحين في رأيه إن لا نراك في سفها وإن لا نظنك من الكذبين أي ما نراك إلا سفيها غير رشيد يغلب على ظننا أنك من جملة الكذبين وقد انقلبت عليهم الحقيقة واستحكم عماهم حيث رموا نبيهم عليه السلام بما هم متصفون به وهو أبعد الناس عن فإنهم السفهاء حقا الكاذبون ويسفه أعظم ممن قابل حق الحق بالرد والإنكار وتكبر عن الانقياد للمرشدين والنصحاء وانقاد قلبه وقالبه لكل شيطان المريد ووضع العبادة في غير موضعها فعبد أو فعبد من لا فعبد من لا يغني عنه شيئا من الأشجار والأحجار وأي كذب أبلغ من كذب من نسب هذه الأمور إلى الله تعالى قال يا قوم ليس بسفها بوجه من الوجوه بل هو الرسول المرشد الرشيد ولكني رسول من رب العالمين أبلغكم رسالات ربي وأنا لكم ناصح أمين فالواجب عليكم أن تتلقوا ذلك بالقبول والانقياد وطاعة رب العباد أو عجبتم أن جاءكم ذكر من ربكم على رجل منكم لينذركم أي كيف تعجبون من أمر لا يتعجب من وأن الله أرسل إليكم رجل منكم تعرفون أمره يذكركم بما فيه مصالحكم ويحثكم على ما فيه النفع لكم فتعجبتم من ذلك تعجب المنكرين Allah Azza wa Jal, he tells us, uh, and it starts off here in uh, verse number 65, and we sent, he says, وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ هُودًا So the people who are called Ad, these people called Ad, we sent to them their brother whose name was Hud, alayhi salam. And he said to them and he addressed them, he said, Oh my people, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no God, no deity that you have besides Him. Afala tatakun. Shall you not fear Him? Shall you not have any taqwa? Shall you not have any shame to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah then said in the next ayah, Qala al-malu al-lazina kafiru min qawmihi The nobles, the chieftains, the high-born people, they said, We think that you're an utter fool. And we think that you're a liar. What you say isn't true, you're mad, you've lost your mind, and there's no reason for us to believe you or to listen to you, let alone obey you. He then said to his people, Laysa bi safaha. He says, I have no foolishness. My mind is sane, my mind is sound, there's nothing wrong with me. But instead, I am the messenger of Allah, Rabbul Alameen. Ibn Sidi, rahimahullah, he says about these ayats, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent to Ad. Their brother, he says, Fin Nasab. He says that he was related to them, that there was a relation between the two. And this is very similar to our story with Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Is that Allah, He sent to them someone that was from them, related to them, and connected to them. Someone that they knew and someone that they could relate to. 
So this proves to us, brothers and sisters, is that when you want to give dawah to someone, if that person wishes to listen, and if they want to lend their ears, and if there's any humility in them, then they'll listen. And if someone does not want to listen, and they don't care, and they don't wish to humble themselves to what you're trying to say, no matter what you say to them, it's never ever going to make sense. And it's never going to be enough. And that is because if Allah has sent to them a stranger, then the first thing they would have said was, send to us someone who's from us. Everyone understand this? If they sent, if Allah sent to them a human being, they say, he's a sinner like we're sinners. We need someone pure. And Allah mentioned this, sent to us angels. And if Allah has sent to them angels, they would have said what? We can relate to a, to an angel because an angel has no lust. An angel has no greed. An angel has no bad or negative feelings and emotions like human beings. So Allah Azawajal, he chose to send to them their brother. He, who was related to them as someone whom they knew, even said he says, and they knew what he was about. And that he wasn't a fool, nor was he mad, nor was he a liar. And that is why Allah chose to send them someone who was close. And this goes to show us is that those who deserve your dawah first should be your family members and your relatives and your neighbors. But it doesn't mean those are going to listen to you. Unfortunately, there may be a total stranger who listens to you more than your own blood. And there's a sad and bitter reality that you must accept. On each and every single level. The level of Islam and kufr. The level of da'wah, of deen, of ilm and of sunnah. I would understand this. And that's why many of the pious predecessors, they used to say, Arba'atun la tu'nisu minhum rushdan. Four people, four types of people. Yahya ibn Ma'ini would say, never expect good from. And from those people, he says, Ibn al-Muhaddith is the son of the scholar of Hadith. In most cases, he won't succeed. In most cases, he will not succeed. And others, they would say, Inna aqalla nas intifa'an bi ilm al-alim ahluhu. The people who benefit and learn the least from a scholar is his own family. And those who benefit and they travel from one corner of the world to the next and get on two and three planes and sacrifice so much just to meet the sheikh and sit with him and give him a hug and a kiss and benefit from him and read to him is someone that has no blood relation. This is not all of the time, but oftentimes this is the case. And those who supported the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he moved to what city? What relations did he have with the Ansar? His own people, his own kinsfolk, his own tribe, his own clan, they were the worst and the ugliest to him. As-Siyuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions in the narration that some of the people of the past, they would say, لا يفقد النبي حرمته إلا في بلدته The only place in which a prophet is disrespected and violated is his own hometown. That's the only time in which he's disrespected and violated, is his own place. And the same applies to dawah as well. Now, the people who don't want to listen to oftentimes are those who are closest to you. And for one reason or another, those who are the furthest from you and the strangest to you are those who listen to you and respect you the most. But there's wisdom in that. And that is to go to show you the true DNA is the DNA of Iman. That's the true faith is the blood of the deen. And your friend, it shouldn't be a scale of color or where he comes from or where she comes from or what they look like or how they walk and talk. It shouldn't be a thing of black and white and tall and short. It should be a thing of believer, non-believer, righteous Muslim, wicked Muslim, knowledge, ilm, deen, sunnah, hard-working student of knowledge, and my own son, my own daughter, my own father, my own cousin, my own neighbor, who doesn't care anything about hadathana and akhbarana. And this is the bitter reality. The moment we accept it, our lives will be easier. The moment we wish to dance around it and act like it doesn't exist, our lives will be what? Difficult. And you shouldn't necessarily be sad or distraught. You shouldn't be sad or distraught because it's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can clearly see that from this story. Allah chose to send them their brother, but their brother wasn't good enough for them. And they insulted him and they disrespected him, even though they knew that he wasn't mad. They knew that he wasn't a fool and they knew he wasn't from the Kavi bean. Are we going understand this or not? Tayyip, another faida that's mentioned here that we benefit from this is to begin your da'wah with the tawheed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To start off your call with connecting the people to their maker, Allah, the mighty and the most high. But I'm going to say something, I'm going to mention something, and it's very important and very dangerous. And not so many people say it or they'll have the courage to say the truth. Starting off with tawheed does not mean the only thing that you talk about is tawheed. 
Beginning your da'wah with tawheed doesn't mean that your entire da'wah is all tawheed. Beginning with tawheed, with a non-Muslim and a mushrik, isn't necessarily the thing that you must do with a Muslim. I would understand this. Last but not least is ignoring and neglecting major things, responsibilities of Islam with the name of Tawheed. Many people, they do this. There is an elephant in the room. Everyone sees and smells, but no one wants to talk about it because it's inconvenient. It's a big problem. So we can avoid this major topic that's from the deen and say what? We're going to keep teaching and calling to? Tawheed. So there's a difference between the two. And the proof for this, the dalil for this, I'm not just making this up, is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sent Mu'ath to Yemen, and the first thing he told him was to call to what? Tawheed. Even though the people that he went to were what? Jews. They were monotheists. So no problem. Muslim, not Muslim. Tayyib, la best. Tawheed, the importance of Tawheed. There's no doubt about that. Then what did the Prophet ﷺ say? And if they obey you in that, step two in your da'wah. And he never ever said, Tawheed, he didn't say that. And this is no disrespect to Tawheed. And this is not scorning Tawheed. We're not saying that at all. But the deen of Al-Islam is a complete deen. Faith and practice. Everyone understand this or not? Everyone got this? He says, if they obey you, tell them about the prayers. If they obey you, tell them about zakah. And beware of taking the most precious of their wealth. To the end of the hadith. Everyone understand this? Let alone the fact, what is tawheed? What is iman and what is aqidah? Is it just one aspect? Or all of the things that we are to believe in and accept? Everyone understand this? So this is a critical point that people of knowledge have mentioned. And not often will you hear this point. So I want to... Yani, give my duty and my responsibility what's meant by this. That's the very first thing that he said, but it wasn't necessarily the what? The only thing that he said. Everyone understand this? Tell you, moving forward, Ibn Sidi Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he then says, or actually back to, the, before we get into Ibn Sa'di's kalam with the time that we have, Hud alayhi salatu wasalam, he said here, Malakum min ilahin ghayruhu, afala tattakuna. He gave them factual information, and he also gave them wa'ad. He gave them an exhortation. He told them the facts. There's no other God. There's no other creator. There's no other deity of worship besides Allah Azza wa Jalla in truth. Afala tattaquna. Shall you not fear him then? In other words, use your sense, use your logic to lead your actions. I would understand this. And that is the fruit of Tawheed and Aqidah. Is that if you believe in it, it must manifest itself in your daily actions. Moving forward, he said, alayhi salam, or Allah Azza wa says in the next ayah, قَالَ الْمَلَءُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ The mala, the high people, the nobles. And this goes to show us that oftentimes wealth, status, power, political influence, oftentimes prevents a person from listening to the truth. And that's a sad reality. But it does not mean that we do not call leaders to Islam. It does not mean that we don't speak to and address influential people. Because if this man accepts Islam, an entire village will accept Islam. An entire city will accept Islam for no other reason except he's influential. But it doesn't mean that we only speak to people of influence and power because oftentimes they are those who are the furthest from listening. Allah Azza wa Jalla then says, Inna lanaraka fi safahatin. It says that you're an utter fool. We see that you're foolish. So this goes to show you that if you call someone to a religion, let alone Islam, let alone the Sunnah, etc. People don't call you foolish. You're brainwashed. You're young. You're not sure about life. You don't know what you want to be. You don't know what you want to do yet. You're going through a phase. You'll take off the hijab. You'll take off your beard. You'll go back to being a normal teenager later on. Once there was a attack in the United States, there were people who lost their lives. And there were people who were accused of taking those people's lives via bombs, via bombs. So... The police and the authorities, they begin to question the families of the suspects. They begin to speak to them and they begin to ask them questions. And they said to them, what happened to your son? Did you not know that your son was dangerous? Did you not know your son was violent? Did you not know that your son, what changed? When did you realize that your son was a violent person? So on and so forth. And it was a family 
People who say that they're Muslim, La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, their fathers are Muslims, grandfathers are Muslims. You know what they told the non-Muslim authorities? The mother, she said, I knew my son was a deviant, and I knew that he was this word and that word. I knew he was violent. I knew he was whatever. I knew he was an extremist when I saw him praying five times a day. She says, once he started making the five daily prayers, I knew that he was off the straight path of Islam. That's what she said. So, and in actuality, one who doesn't pray and never prays and never makes salat, they are those who are off the straight path. So the people of falsehood will always accuse you of their sickness and of their illness. They will always accuse you of their disease. And that's because they have to mask and hide their problems. So they'll call you a name and they'll insult you. And that's the next fa'ida is that if you wish to divert someone or push someone away from speaking the truth, the easiest, simplest way is to call them a bad name, insult them. And that's why Shafi'i Rahim Allah Ta'ala's have said, مَا نَذَرْتُ عَالِمًا إِلَّا غَلَبْتُ وَمَا نَذَرْنِي أَوْ مَا نَذَرْتُ جَاهِلًا إِلَّا غَلَبَنِي He says, there's never been a scholar that I had a scientific discussion or debate with except that I won. Not out of pride or arrogance, but the truth. I didn't lose a fight. I never lost a battle. And he says, I never debated an ignorant man except that he beat me. Meaning the ignorant man, the first thing that he does if he can't win is to call you a what? A bad name, to insult you, to slander you. And there's no proof, there's no evidence, there's no logic. So the first thing that they said is, who is Allah? Is Allah the only one? Why do we worship idols? They didn't mention any of those things. They says, we see that you're in foolishness and that you're a fool. They insulted him in his personality. And they didn't even discuss the facts that he mentioned to them. Malakum min ilahin ghayruhu. There's no ilah besides Allah in reality that deserves to be worshipped, right? That's a fact. Did they falsify their claim? Did they say that this God or this idol or this spirit, they didn't even discuss that and they don't have to discuss that. The only thing they needed to do was insult him and call him a fool and call him a liar. And this is the way of any person of any type of falsehood, as Shafi'i said. The knowledgeable man couldn't beat me. The ignorant man automatically and instantly what? Beat me. How did he beat me if he is an ignoramus? Because he did what? He called me a bad name. And the Arabs, they have a famous clay to say that says, When a person's argument is weak or short, his tongue becomes long. It's not any facts. There's no real information that you can say, so I slander you and I insult you. And don't take this from me. Any person of falsehood is one consistent theme is that they give you labels before they deal with facts. Muslim, non-Muslim, Muslims in internal fighting, they give labels and bad names before they actually discuss what's being said. Are we understanding the point I'm trying to get to? Moving forward, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, Qala ya qawmi, Khud alayhi salam, He says, Oh my people, and this is a very important point of da'wah, and that is to appeal to people with their emotions as well. Appeal to people with the relationship that you have with them as well. Ibrahim said, Oh my father. The Prophet Islam, he said, oh my people, appeal to them. I'm your brother, I'm your neighbor. Everyone understand this? And then he said, alayhi salatu salam, laysa bi safahatun, walakinni rasulun min rabbil alameen. He says, I'm not a fool. Rather, he didn't say that. He says, there's no foolishness with me. So it goes to show the proof and the permissibility of defending oneself. It's permissible to defend yourself. You should always defend yourself every single time. But occasionally, it's nothing wrong with defending your honor and refuting and rebuting or rebuttaling whatever the people say about you that isn't true. He clearly said that I'm not a fool. And then he affirmed after he denied it, he then replaced it. And that's the last thing that I'll mention tonight is that it isn't enough to negate and deny. It isn't enough to say you can't do this. You shouldn't do this. This is bad. This is illegal. This is haram. But you have to fill the void now. Not only am I not a fool, but I'm also the messenger of Allah Rabbil Alameen. So he didn't leave them empty handed. Because he, if he wasn't a fool, that doesn't prove anything or say anything. What's the purpose of me going to you? I'm not a fool. And okay. But I'm a messenger from Allah Rabbil Alameen. Listen to me, obey me, follow my message. Everyone understand this? So in brief, in brief brothers and sisters, one of the most important stories of Hud alayhi salatu wasalam is the concept of critical debate. It's to sit down and to discuss and to critically debate the issue. 
He spoke to his people. His people spoke back to him. He mentioned something and they mentioned something. Obviously, we know who won and we know who was better and who was actually speaking the truth. But it goes to show you the way of Ahlul Jahiliyyah. And the book of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah, is a very important book, Masail al Jahiliyyah, the issues of Jahiliyyah. He wrote that book to show you that there are many things that the people of Shirk and Kufr did and said that are consistent themes within the people of this Ummah. And that is what we see in this story of rejecting the truth, of insulting, of using bigotry, of not investigating facts, and using pride and arrogance to prove that someone is upon the truth. So the story of Hud you have to read it yourself. I've given you the sources. I've told you what sources to look into. You can look in those books of tafsir in English and Arabic and other languages, Urdu as well, Persian, Farsi, whatever language you speak or read. Inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, with these few humble keys that I've given you, they can unlock many closed and locked doors to the secrets of this story and of this uh, great prophet, this great uh, uh, bearer of revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to allow us to understand this story and to implement it in our daily lives. Allah surely knows best and with Him is all success. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.